I came across a headline the other day. LIRR turnstiles are putting a halt to cheating on FAIR. You would think this headline is recent, but no. This headline is from the New York Times in 1964. 1964. You know what else is going on in 1964? In that year, Martin Luther King Jr. received the Nobel Peace Prize. 1964 was 10 presidents ago. And in 1964, I'm betting half of you watching this, your parents were probably not even born. And if they were, they were probably wee little children. 1964 was 60 years ago. And since this article is published, to this day, New York City has still been dealing with fair evasion. And it's a hot topic right now. In fact, last week, I posted about the rise in subway fare, and the comment section got pretty spicy. A good amount of you mentioned fare evasion, and that's what we're going to talk about today, fare evasion. Who exactly are the fare evaders, and what's the proposal to deal with it? Welcome to Urban Caffeine. My name is Thea, and you're watching a channel that talks about anything and everything public transit. If you find public transit interesting, make sure to hit that like button. So fare evasion. If you live in New York City and don't jump the turnstiles yourself, I would be shocked if you've never seen this phenomenon happen. If evaders are not hurtling over turnstiles, they're crawling under them. I was once waiting for someone at the subway station and I was waiting near the turnstiles. I probably waited for this person for 15 minutes. While I was waiting, I couldn't help see how many people were jumping the turnstiles or going through the emergency exit. So I counted and within that 15 minute period, I counted 20 people. 20 people did not pay for fare as I was standing there and watching them. Some would blatantly jump the turnstiles, others would just find somebody to open the emergency door for them. There was this one person who paid for the turnstile but had to open the emergency door to get their bike in and the person behind them just walked behind the bike and got in for free. So that's one turnstile plus 15 minutes equals a ton of people not paying. And New York City has thousands of turnstiles. That's a lot of free fare. Recently, the New York City's Metropolitan Transit Authority, or MTA, came out with a 124-page report on fare and toll evasion. Link to this document is in the description below. And if you download this, you might as well order some eye drops because this report is long and dry. But it did present some very interesting facts. According to this report, about 400,000 subway rides are unpaid every day. 400,000. That's more than the population of Tampa, Florida. And to really paint the picture, this report even showed how many Yankee stadiums those numbers could fill. That's a lot of people, and the buses are even worse. It's said that fare evaders on buses can fill up 16 city fields worth of people. That's equal to 700,000. So who exactly are fare evaders? This report identified five of them. The first one being the opportunist. This is a person who's not only able to pay, but willing to pay. But if a door is left open, they will go in and enjoy a free ride. I mean, this is New York City. If something is just right there and it's free, you can't be faulted for taking it. Next on the list is the frustrated evader. Imagine this scenario. You just arrive at the train station and you hear the announcement that your train is approaching the station. You know for a fact with absolute certainty that if you make a run for it, you can make that train because you've done it a million times. You get to the turnstile and you think, ha ha, I'm gonna make my train. You swipe your metro card and you get eh. In those green letters, you see the words insufficient funds. Dun dun dun. So you sprint to the MetroCard machine, and there are three at that station. But to the left, the machine is broken, and to the right, doesn't accept credit cards at the moment. And the one machine, the one machine in the entire station that actually works, is being used by a family of foreign tourists who can't figure it out. So what do you do? If you don't go through that turnstile now, you're gonna be late for work, you're gonna miss a meeting, you won't get that promotion, your boss is gonna fire you. So it's time yeah. to limber up. And that is what the MTA calls the frustrated evader. 
An economically stressed evader is someone who truly cannot afford the fare. New York City already has programs in place for those that earn less than the federal poverty limit. But in my opinion, that's not enough. This report outlines proposals to expand or raise the limit, and I'll talk more about proposed solutions later. But guess who else doesn't have money? Students. Yes, the city does have a student fair program, but this is extremely limited. So what are students to do on the weekends or the times when there are no classes? I honestly think that we should just have an overall youth fair where everybody 18 and under just rides for free or at least be automatically discounted because chances are most teens are not going to be gainfully employed. But like I said, we'll talk more about the proposed solutions later. In any society, no matter what, there will always be those that will go against the grain and not pay for fare. Some societies have more of these folks, some have less. Maybe there's the perception that it's cool to not pay fare, or maybe they just simply don't believe in it. Whatever the case, whatever their guiding principle is, these types of fare evaders will always exist. So what are we supposed to do? This report is 124 pages for a reason. It defines the fair evaders and gives quite a few recommendations on how to deal with them. But in general, this report focuses on four areas when it comes to addressing fair evasion. The first area is education. Education is how to solve the problem with the opportunistic evader, along with environment, which we'll talk about later. In a recent Reddit thread where people are talking about the planned price hike on a subway fare, the overall consensus was people don't mind the price hike if there was actually an improvement in the quality of service and facilities. I think the MTA should be better at telling the story on where the money is going and what kind of improvements they're making. In all the years that I've worked in marketing and PR, I've learned that if you don't have your narrative successfully distributed, somebody else will make that narrative for you. That's just how the world works. The idea is that properly educating people on why it's important to pay fair and where the fair money is going will ideally make people want to do the right thing and pay fair, even if it's inconvenient. A quick thought on this though, there's a saying in the design world that good design is invisible. We notice bad design all the time because bad design creates so much friction in our lives that it's quite noticeable. With good design, ideally there's no friction so we don't notice it and we just move about with our lives. To think about this in subway speak, say that trains are running 10 to 15 minutes. 10 to 15 minutes is a very long time to wait for a train. So you will notice this strain and you will complain about it. But if a train is running every three minutes, chances are this schedule is not gonna put a strain on your normal day to day and therefore you just live your life and not notice any strain when taking the subway. And that's what normal should feel like. Normal should feel frictionless. And frictionless is invisible, but it takes good design to create that kind of normal. So if the MTA is really doing a lot to improve the subway, the services and the facilities, this should be talked about so that we can pay attention and hold them accountable. The second on the list is equity for those with low income, with disabilities, seniors, and students. I just came back from a trip to Seattle. Did you know that Seattle has a youth fair? and it's zero dollars. That's right, anyone 18 years or younger pays zero dollars to ride the trains, buses, and water taxis. And it doesn't stop there. Senior citizens and those with special needs or in certain income limits only pay one dollar. Now, just how easy it is to get these special fare cards, I don't know. If you live in Seattle and pay a special fare, comment down below how easy or not easy it is to get a special fare card. My point here is that Seattle has figured out how to supplement the fare for those at a disadvantage. I'm disappointed that New York isn't at par with this. We already have an existing fare program for students, seniors, those with disabilities, and those with low income, but it's not enough. I believe we can do better. For example, with the student discount, it's not even available on weekends, just certain hours on school days. This report recommends giving more rights to students and having just one student fare card versus nine different student fare cards to make things easier. I just want to stop right here and point out that the fact that the MTA has 
nine different types of student fair cards is telling of just how convoluted this whole thing is. Like I said earlier, I vote let's just have the youths free. If not 18 years or younger, at least 14 years old and younger. Having it free for youth overall just a nice thing to do, but it also trains the youth to use public transit, to appreciate public transit. And when they grow up, they would be advocates for good public transportation. Ideally, if these youths grow up with free fare, they're not trained to evade fare. And hopefully, once they're gainfully employed adults, they have no problem paying fare. In fact, they're happy to pay fare to pay it forward for the youths that are coming in. Seattle does it. I think New York should do the same thing. Comment your thoughts on this. There are more suggestions on this report for special fare. For example, for the economically stressed evader, the report recommends lowering the income limit requirement. Like I said, link to this report is in the description below if you want to read more. What I do want to raise is the ease of getting the special fare. Is it easy to get special fare? Logically, it should be, but I don't pay special fare myself, so I wouldn't know. If you live in New York and you pay special fare, comment below and please enlighten us. Next up, a lot of fare evasion can be solved by better user experience design, architectural layout, and modernized devices. An example of better user experience right now is that the Omni readers make it so people can pay directly with a credit or debit card. Using a credit card directly for the subway or bus eliminates the need to buy a Metro card. If you can remember my example earlier of fare evading because of the difficulty to purchase a metro card, paying directly with a credit card is a great way to prevent that. It's 2023, majority of us have a debit or credit card and we know how to use it. And by the way, using a credit card directly to pay for the subway is called an open loop payment method. And I'm currently doing a collaboration with the creator of Not Just Bikes on their new podcast, The Urbanist Agenda, on this very topic, payment systems for transit. Once that podcast is available, I'll definitely let you know, so stay tuned. As for architectural layout, my example would be something like this. There's an actual station where there are platforms on both sides of the track and there are entrances from the outside world on both sides of the station. Logically, you would think these are turnstiles so you can easily go directly to your platform if you enter on the same side. But no! Both are exits and only one has the turnstiles to enter. So if you enter from here and you need to get to Brooklyn, you would need to go up then down some steps, pay the fare, then go up and down and more steps to your platform. So chances are, if your train is arriving, you've got no time for this. It's time to limber up. This frustrated evader maneuver can be easily eliminated if both sides just had turnstiles to enter. And for modernized devices, let's talk about one of the solutions that this report is suggesting for the entry. Plastic gateway doors. This isn't new. Stations all over the world use this type of method. I personally think this is great for people with luggage, strollers, wheelchairs, and bikes. This is going to need some high jumping skills, and going under would require commando crawling. According to this report, the technology behind these gates can detect if the person's in a wheelchair or has a stroller so it can delay the closing of the doors. But what I wonder is how fast it is to close and open for a regular commuter. The thing about turnstiles is that when a person goes through, the portal is automatically shut. With this new design, if the gate closes too slow, then more than one person can go through. But the fact that this type of gate is used in many stations around the world it has some success. It's reported that if this type of gate is approved, special doors and emergency exits can be eliminated since these doors can serve as the emergency exit themselves. After all, these exits are the super portals for fare evaders. Once one of these are open, all bets are off. Droves of people are gonna go through that door. Like that story I said earlier where a person swiped their metro card to go into this turnstile but had to open the emergency exit to get their bike and the people following them just went in with the bike. But whatever is decided with the turnstiles, whether we keep them or we use this gate or this gate or even update the turnstiles themselves, could we please get rid of these gates? These feel like straight out of a dungeon and are just plain ugly. And the last area of recommendation is in enforcement. This is especially for those that will evade the fare no matter what. You know what's interesting about Seattle's light rails and streetcars? They don't have any barriers or gates. You just hop on. That's right, no turnstiles. 
They expect people to pay as they enter the station. It's kind of like the select bus service in Manhattan. You just hop on. You're just expected to pay and supposedly at any point in time, an inspector can get on that bus and check if everybody paid their fare. But I guess I don't ride the SBS bus that often because I've never seen this happen. If you have, comment down below. Funny enough, on my first few days in Seattle, I asked a couple strangers on the light rail and on the streetcar if they've ever seen an inspection happen. And both of them, long-term locals, one even born and raised in Seattle, has never seen an inspection happen. Ironically, on the last day of my trip, I met up with someone I knew who's lived in Seattle for a few years now. They told me that very day, that very day they came to meet me, they took the light rail and an inspection happened and three people got kicked off the light rail and were told to pay fare. From what I understand, the first time that you are caught not paying fare, you get a warning and the second time you get a hefty fine. If you're from Seattle, comment below if you have something to say about this. But going back to New York Transit, inspections like this are recommended in order to prevent fare evasion, especially on the buses. This 124 page report lays out other recommendations to deal with fare evasion. And like I said, link is in the description below if you want to read it. And this is a rather long video for me. Let me know your thoughts on fare evasion. I'm sure there's a lot more to be said about it. If you like videos like this discussing topics on transportation, let me know so we could make more videos. And if you want to support this channel beyond just subscribing, make sure to check out patreon.com slash urbancaffeine. Until the next video, thank you all so much for watching and happy New Yorking.